Don't think you're safe in a country area either. Air pollution test stations up and down the country prove otherwise. It's all a question of degree. Here's the type of apparatus we use. It's basically simple enough. A filter paper is placed inside and samples of the atmosphere are sucked through. And just to show you that air pollution is always present, here's a typical set of results. Suburb of a clean city, say. Center of a clean city. Suburb of a dirty city. And the center of a dirty city. To a scientist, of course, it's doubly offensive, for he knows it's stupid waste. Coal is sunshine, and only we could make it hide the sun. Today we live in the second coal age and retain the habits of the first. A prodigal age, wasteful, ugly, ridden with smoke. Coal, the basic fuel of a nation, whose heat and energy are only half its wonder. Shall we continue to waste its wealth and pollute the very air we breathe? Or shall we in our wisdom treat it as befits our present knowledge? Over 200 million tons of coal are consumed in this country every year. And consumed is the word. For so much goes up in smoke. To an economist, there's only one sensible way to treat such vital natural resources. That is to squeeze from it all its wealth in the way that the gas industry already does it, to the tune of 28 million tons each year. And here, under controlled conditions, they first extract gas. Gas for an ever-increasing range of purposes in industry and in our homes. A clean, flexible, smokeless fuel. And nothing wasted. For what's left is coke, a solid smokeless fuel. And the other byproducts, thousands of them. One item alone. 900,000 tons of ammonium sulphate, fertilizing the land, giving rich crops and fat, healthy cattle. This is economy. And this is waste. Representing a mighty bill we all must pay, whether we live in smoky cities or in more sunny places. Think of some of the items in that bill. First, the direct waste of a dwindling treasure, wrung from the earth by the sweat and sometimes blood of human effort, dug and carried from miles below the surface to be sent up in futile clouds of filth. The indirect cost of increased wash bills, cleaning, sweeping, the dirty trades as we call them. The cost of damage to crops and vegetation, and that's no small item. The cost of smoke inspectors and the inefficient plant that they're there to watch. A hundred pounds to clean the glass at Kew after every bad London farm. Sixty million pounds in 25 years to clean our public buildings. A fortune to restore the Houses of Parliament. And another fortune to restore the Abbey. A form of social vandalism towards an irreplaceable heritage. Artificial lighting in daylight hours. And the cost to everyone when transport is delayed, stopped, paralyzed. Add in the cost of things we cannot price ill health, fatigue, and inefficiency. No economist would pretend to know the total cost of smoke in a nation's economy. But he can give a conservative estimate. Between us, we make well over two and a half million tons of grimy filth each year. And to make it, we use tons of precious fuel that we can ill spare. It's uneconomic, it's outmoded, it's a stupid, vicious circle. We can, we must break. A smoking chimney never was a sign of prosperity. It's a sign of cruel waste. Wasted labor, wasted fuel, wasted health. It's a form of inefficiency we can no longer afford, because we pay for it, out of our pockets, in rates and taxes, and of course as a nation. For that reason, it concerns us all. Town planner, social worker, housing officer, the stoker in a factory, or the businessman who runs it. 
the scientist, the doctor, the ordinary man and his wife, whether they live in town or country. Smokeless air isn't some vague ideal. The remedies are known. They only need applying. Indeed, they are being applied. Let's see what's happening in industry. We know, for example, that an old boiler like this, plus inefficient stoking, can throw over a ton of soot and tarry matter into the air each week. When such plant is renewed, let's see to it that it's replaced by properly designed and tested equipment. Industry is increasingly aware that smoke means inefficiency. That's why you'll find stokers being trained up and down the country, with certificates for proficiency too. This can be followed up by on-the-spot guidance from stoker demonstrators. For a good stoker these days is smoke conscious. A neatly fitted mirror like this can help him keep his eye on things. Better still, what about these smoke eliminating doors? They're easy to fit and are adaptable to most types of hand-fired boilers. There's plenty of research going on into these problems and there's no longer any need for guesswork or rule of thumb control. Instruments can help tremendously. They enable the stoker to get the best out of his boiler without waste of fuel and without smoke. The ideal that every conscientious stoker strives for. Mechanical stoking too. In short, it's been proved, and industry knows it, that with care in firing and with modern installations, there's no longer any need for this. And by modern installations, I mean not only improvements in using what is still, after all, raw fuel, but new designs using other forms of fuel. Here is gas in use in a modern biscuit factory, increasingly in use, in fact, in thousands of minor and some major industries throughout the country. For by such methods, you have more control, more efficiency and cleanliness. Your fuel, in fact, is used for its proper purpose, not to make smoke, but to give heat. The battle's not yet won in industry, but at least it's being fought. Now, what about the other villain of the piece? The domestic chimney. There, you're really playing with fire. We burn more coal per head in open grates than any other country. Over 30 million tons of it each year in 12 million old-fashioned type grates. Often to heat one room per house, and that badly. Creating filth, poisoning the air. Putting a pall between us and the sun. It's a complex problem because it concerns that proud and personal possession, our homes. What can we do to help the housewife in her daily battle against this evil thing called smoke? First, hard facts. In the laboratory, the old coal fire has been tested and found wanting. The bulk of its heat goes up the chimney. With a fire sealed into the grate with proper draught control, coal gives a marked improvement, true. But, same fire, same conditions, same quantity of fuel, only this time, coke. Result? Much higher efficiency, more heat, and no smoke. Here is one of the real answers to the problem. More and more smokeless fuels, solid like coke and the flexible fuels like gas that has already been taken away. An increase in the use of the one means increased availability of the other. Fuels not only smokeless, but which give more heat too. And of course, the development of suitable apparatus designed to use its appropriate smokeless fuel with maximum efficiency, whether it be gas, or solid smokeless fuels like coke. 
to the housewife, constant hot water is not a luxury, but a well-earned necessity to hand when and how she wants it. Efficiency, economy, cleanliness, those are the touchstones we should judge by. For our convenience and on the larger issue of our nation's fuel resources. Fortunately, economy and convenience, even elegance, can go hand in hand. Now, individual action along such lines can help enormously, but it's still a communal problem and requires communal treatment too. Certain cities already have plans in hand. Manchester and Coventry have actually put them into operation by establishing smokeless zones. They mark off an area, and within that area, every known remedy is strictly applied. In homes, offices, industry, the installation of any apparatus emitting smoke is strictly prohibited. And what's more, it can be made to work. And then the idea is to create more such zones until they meet. There you are, the ideal. An entire city free from smoke. If one city, why not all? A costly undertaking? We already paid. Ask the economist. Ask the doctor. We haven't money to burn. Yet every year we send it up in smoke. We it is as citizens who pay the bill. We it is between us who can create a smokeless air in which to breathe. Not in a day, or in a week, or even in a year. It's a slow, laborious struggle in which we all must fight. Smoke has crept insidiously into our lives and bred a kind of apathy. The time has come when it must creep into our conscience. There let it breed not apathy, but action. Out of gloom and darkness, let us strive towards the light. Not reaching for the moon, but asking that we might see the sun. Penetrate the haze of ignorance, for in this age we know that ugliness is waste. Yet we it is who every day create that ugliness, wasting our substance and our nation's wealth. So we it is who must take action, rid our country of its legacy of filth, for our own and for our children's sake. For they, like us, are not only of the earth and of the water, but of the air they breathe. And that air can never be fit for them to breathe in, where no fruits nor flowers ripen, nor come to a seasonable perfection.